Okay, everybody, welcome to the March uh, Grand Rounds, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this meeting, who is Petra Lewis, who is a professor of radiology and obstetrics up from Dartmouth. Petra went to medical school in Guy's in London, in England, and then she did her Brexit as well uh, several years later and moved to Dartmouth in 1987. Uh, yeah, where she's stayed ever since, really, and then she's now vice chair for education uh, at Dartmouth. She's a leading authority on radiology education and uh, has developed uh, platforms for radiologists to, um, to uh, develop their scholarly work and also Red Exam, which is a tool that residents use to be assessed and, uh, and uh, um, monitored during their uh, attachments. So we're really delighted to have her here. And uh, in case you were wondering, yes, she is named after Petra the city as well. Thanks, Petra. Hang on, I've got to turn my lanyard mic on. Of course, I've attached to me and then can't see it. There we go. Well, good morning. Thanks for inviting me to Yale. Um, this is, you know, a little bit off the beat of usual talks. There's sort of nothing interpretive radiology wise in it. Um, here are my learning objectives. Those who are in my uh, session this morning on class and flipping knows all about learning objectives. I'm just going to let you guys read them. So I'm going to talk about a number of different factors that affect how you learn, how your trainees learn from you, and how you remember stuff. And although I'm going to be talking about them separately, just to make it a little bit clear, we've got to realize that in most learning situations, these things um, intermix and overlap to some way. So just to get that straight. And, and these things I'm going to be talking about, they apply to both the teacher and the learner. They apply through kindergarten, through learning, you know, into retirement. There's no age specificity. And they not only apply to the cognitive skills, but they apply to learning motor skills, such as um, learning how to fly an airplane. In my case, learning how to parallel park is the next thing I'm going to try and apply it to because I still can't do it. And into sports. So there's a very wide variety of situations that you can apply the same techniques to. Now, this is nothing new. This is nothing, you know, that people have suddenly discovered in the last few years. And in fact, a lot of the theory from these go back hundreds, if not thousands of years, as I'll show you. All right, but we're going to have a little bit of fun, so I don't want to be too serious about this. And so um, here is a 12-item shopping list. Okay, it's a random shopping list, um, a little bit of a strange shopping list, that we're going to memorize it. And we're going to memorize it using a memory palace that we're going to build instantaneously here. So what I want you to do is sort of follow where I'm looking, where I'm pointing, and visualize what I'm talking about. And I know that part of your brain is gonna be saying this woman is completely bonkers, um, but just kind of go with the flow for this a minute and all will become apparent later on. All right, so turn around, you come in this back door, you come into this back door here, and as you walk into the back door, you see a giant banana. You start to walk down these stairs, but the stairs are broke, covered with broken glass. Lots of lots of broken light bulbs on these stairs. You come up here and plastered over this wall are a whole load of postage stamps. And you suddenly remember that there is a free lunch with this lecture. So you go out to go and get a drink first of all, and there's some Coca-Cola sitting there. You pick up the Coca-Cola, you take a big swig of it and spit it out because it's covered with horseradish. <laughs> You spit it onto, so covered with horseradish, where are we up to? So you then look at your shoes, you spout horseradish all over your shoes, so they need a polish, right? Giving up on the drinks for now, you decide, nice, hot dogs. I'll have a hot dog with my lunch. Pick up a hot dog. As you do, you take a look at it and see it's covered with motor oil instead of mustard. The motor oil drips on the floor, you slip over, cut your knee open, and you need to put a Band-Aid on it. Eventually, you hobble back in here to come and sit down, and mysteriously, the front row of seats is covered with grass. So you come up to us, like, what the heck is the grass growing here? And you look inside, and there's a fruitcake that somebody's dumped that was given to them by their grandmother. You like fruitcake, though. So you cut it open, you take a look inside, but instead of raisins, there's pickles in it. Okay, moving on. 
So we're going to talk first of all about some basic memory concepts, and these are the ones I'm going to initially focus on. And these are the theory behind how we learn and how we memorize. So you've probably heard the terms working memory and long-term memory before. And um, long, working memory used to be called short-term memory. It's now called working memory. And both of these are vital for us in terms of memorization. I'm a bit of a computer geek, so I like to think of these in terms of computers. So our working memory is our RAM. It's absolutely vital for us to be able to process information via our RAM to get it into our long-term memory or our hard disk. You can't have it to hard disk that works without having a RAM. And if you have a RAM, the information is not going to stay very long before it's got to be stored in your hard disk. So these two things interrelate. Now, what is encoding? Everything that we experience, we see, we read, we hear, we feel, we smell, has to be translated from that sensory impulse into some sort of form that can be memorized. And our working memory does a lot of that encoding. Once it's been encoded, that information has to be consolidated with other information, new inf other new information, other information we knew already, and then reorganized in our brain. And this process is called consolidation. So it will stick there and so we'll be able to retrieve it. So here's another way to think about it. So encoding, you're kind of putting the money in the bank consolidating it, you're grouping various sensory impulses together, various little memories together to make larger groups of memories. And then we have to retrieve those memories at some point. And that's where the challenging comes. So memories are available if we've stored them in the first place. And a lot of times we think we've forgotten it and it's just because we never actually store that information. So you walk in your house, you put your keys down, and then you can't find your keys later, it's not because you've forgotten where your keys are, it's because you never memorized it in the first place. If you put your keys down and said, that's where they are, and actually effectively consciously memorized it, then you won't forget it. Memories are accessible if we can retrieve them. And that's where the challenges come, because we're really pretty good at storing information, we're not so good at retrieving it. Now our working memory, our short-term memory, operates within this learning environment. And there's a whole lot of things in the learning environment that can affect whether those memories get into our long-term, get processed by our working memory and get into our long-term memory. So are we interested in it? Are we tired? Is there too much cognitive load for us to be able to absorb things? Do we think it's important? Are we distracted because actually we're on Facebook instead of listening to the lecture? Do we know anything about this topic? Are we paying attention? What is the context that it's in? I'm going to talk about a little bit longer. Now, my daughter um, is a beekeeper. She's also quite a good artist. And when I was getting this lecture together, she said, wow, mom, this is just like the bees. I'll draw you a picture. And she said, so the pollen is the memories. And the bees are trying to encode the pollen into honey in the hive, in the long-term memory. And whether that pollen ever gets put into honey depends on a whole load of things within that learning environment, the weather, whether there's a bird eating them, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, I thought it was kind of cute, so I kept in. What is clear is that sleeping is vital for us to be able to remember stuff. And they've actually sort of parsed this out, such that first of all, we start by consolidating those memories in the hippocampus, then moving them to the cortex, and then they get rehearsed and reorganized within the cortex. It's not just that there's a little you know, memory that gets plugged into a hole. It has to be reorganized, brought back, more information attached to it. And here's a couple of experiments that show this really nicely. So these are a group of subjects who had to learn a, um, sensory, a, a motor task, a visual motor task. And they were taught that task, and then they performed that task at 10 o'clock on day one. They performed it again, 10 o'clock on day one, okay? They didn't do anything in between. And then they went to sleep. And when they woke up, they performed it a third time and they were way better, right? Nothing happened. They didn't stay up all night rehearsing that particular task. All they did was go to sleep and they were better by the next morning. So the obvious correlate to this is what happens with sleep deprivation. So those people who sort of like, you know, you 
cramming before an exam, you know, your core exam coming up and you're staying up really late at night and, and thinking that you're going to work through this. Well, in this case, they took six different groups of individuals. This was their baseline performance before they've been taught the task. Okay. Groups one, two, three, four, and five, the red bars, were all allowed to go to sleep every night. And group one was tested on day one, group two on desk two, and so on. You can see that that sleep again markedly improved their performance. Group three, however, were sleep deprived between day zero and one. So immediately after they'd learned the task, they were then allowed to sleep between days one and two and two and three, and then they were tested. But look at the difference between the regular group three that had that sleep. They weren't tired at this point but they had never been able to consolidate that information through sleep. Now let's talk a little bit about context and frameworks. It is really difficult for us to learn something that we know absolutely nothing about. So if I gave you this sentence and then I asked you tomorrow what this sentence was, it, it kind of, it's a nonsensical sentence, right? So it's actually very difficult for us to be able to learn. Anyone have an idea what I'm talking about? What I might be referring to? <laughs> now it makes sense, okay? The notes were sour because the seam split. It's a bagpipe. Here's an experiment that was interesting. So they took two groups of individuals. One group were baseball fans and one group were people like me who know absolutely squat about baseball and, you know, I don't even know the terms that, you know, I get my cricket terms mixed up with it and things like that. So they took those two groups and they played them an audio commentary of a baseball match, right? So like for the radio. And then they asked them to recall what they could remember after a certain period of time of that commentary. So the, the baseball fans, they remembered all about the scores and the hits and the strikes and the, they have runs, right? Yeah. Um, and all that sort of stuff. The baseball idiots like me, they remembered what music was playing in the background, the commercials that played over the tannoy, what the, they said the weather was happening at the time, if any you know, uniform was described or something that was happening out in the, um, in the spectators. So they couldn't remember the stuff that was to do with baseball because that baseball stuff had no context. It didn't make any sense to them. So this becomes very important when we're teaching our learners. We can't really, we were talking this morning about, you know, doing teaching exercises at these higher bloomless levels, these higher learning objectives, but they've got to have a, they've got to have a base. They've got to have a frame. And so if you go in with a, a learning exercise to a group of first to fourth years, where the first years know nothing about that subject, they're gonna learn very, very little. They've got to have some kind of a framework to put it into. So if, so if you are trying to encode new information, which are the colored shapes here, and you already have a reasonable framework, you know something basic about the subject, then encoding that information, that stuff's gonna stick. If you don't have that framework, so you have very little context and you try and encode the new information, an awful lot of it is going to be lost. You have nothing to stick it to. Another memory concept is chunking. What our brain does is it tries to be efficient. So we don't remember each little individual piece of information. What it does is group those pieces of information together into larger chunks for us to be able to memorize them and particularly to help recall. Chunking is really important for us to be able to memorize stuff. And it's really important for us to be able to do this as we move from being a novice to an expert. So to learn these colors, it's much easier to group them as a rainbow to remember them like this. Credit cards, this is not my credit card. Um, so don't write it down, it's my chairs. Um, you, we group them into groups of four because it's much easier to write and recall that as groups of four than it is a group of 16. So how can we use this in our lectures? Well, we can pre-chunk the information for the learners. So one slide should only have one information that relates to one learning objective or part of one learning objective. You should link related information and anything that's not to do with that should be put somewhere else. 
So this idea that we have to have, you know, n nine lines of text on a slide that not only cover the anatomy of the organ we're talking about, but the physiology and the pathology, you shouldn't do that. You split it off, talk about the anatomy, then you talk about the physiology, then you talk about different types of pathology. So chunk the information together in a way that our learners can easily remember. As we encode the information, we consolidate the information and we are chunking it, we're developing what's called memory schemas. And so these memory schemas are these complex frameworks that allow us to very efficiently organize our memory and very efficiently retrieve it. And as we develop, again, from novices to experts, our memory schemas become much more complex, uh, but, but much more able to retrieve information from different points. So a novice memory schema who has never seen Santa Claus before and is just learning what Santa Claus is may have to go through this very linear pathway when they look at a picture before they can analyze it and say it's Santa Claus. An expert, however, can look at any one of these items, the fact that he has black boots or he has you know, a sack of toys or whatever, and immediately these are interrelated. He'll look at one of these and it will invoke the connections to the others and be able to come up with the diagnosis of Santa Claus. Priming is an interesting thing and we touched on it briefly this morning. So priming is that you are given one stimulus and that stimulus can be visual, it can be verbal, it can be something written, it can be some behavior. And what that stimulus is affects how you respond to a different stimulus. So I want you all to think of a fruit. First fruit that comes into your mind. How many of you have thought about one of these? Fair number of you, okay? So I primed you to think of yellow fruit. Right. So they use this in advertising a whole lot. So there's a lot of priming going on. If you start to look at TV shows, you'll see that they're priming in them. So here, American Idol, they're sitting with a whole load of Coca-Colas in front of them. What that's priming your brain is if you go at the commercial break to the fridge, open the fridge and see a can of Coca-Cola there, you are more likely to pick Coca-Cola than you are 7-Up. Okay, it's primed you. Let me show you this experiment. So this experiment, they took a supermarket and they were selling two types of wine, German wine and French wine. For one week, they played German music in the background. And for one week, they played French music in the background. And they calculated the ratios of the different types of wines that they sold in that time. And as you might guess from this, in the German music week, they sold way more German wine. In the French music week, they sold way more French wine. Now, this is unconscious. I mean, I don't think, you know, people were going into the store going, mm, um, papa, I'm going to go and get Liebfrau Milch, right? It's an unconscious priming that pushes us to do things. And this is out there and being done to us the whole time, and we're being manipulated and we don't know it. And I kind of think about these as like warm-up exercises of the brain. It sort of gets it going along a certain pathway, warms up a certain muscle. So how can we use it in teaching? Well, learning objectives. By reading the learning objectives at the beginning and then applying to what I want you to learn, your brain is looking out for the information that it applies to those learning objectives, whether you're consciously doing it or not. Doing pre-testing. If I'd given you a little quiz right at the beginning about memory and learning theory, even before you knew anything about it, even if you were like randomly guessing the answers, I would still be priming your brain for the, info, for the information it's about to receive, and you would still test better at the end than this situation where I've not done that. So pre-testing, even when they haven't been given the information, primes your brain. Now let's come back to medical school education. So, you know, how is an awful lot of what we're doing now done, medical school education, post, Medical school looks remarkably like this conference room. You know, it's done like this, right? So you go to lectures, you hear the same or similar topics, uh, you read information again and again, or you watch videos, or you do online modules or whatever. And this is what is called repeated review. This person didn't really get the idea about highlighting as an effective <laughs> method for finding important information. So that's what's called repeated review. You look at it again and again and again. So, you know, this 
gives you what is called the illusion of mastery because you come familiar with the text of the information but you don't necessarily understand the concepts behind it and you can't necessarily apply it to different situations other than the one it was presented in. Now, it's a very effective way for cramming for an exam the next day, but it's not an efficient way for long-term learning. It's not effective. And in fact, I remember for, um, you know, I was in the time when you had a separate physics boards and, you know, I, I did lots of repeated review. I had no didn't understand 99% of the physics. Um, I went in, I crushed the physics, but I actually physically remember walking out of the door and feeling like I was kind of flushing that information kind of down the toilet the moment I walked out the exam, which is probably why my physics sucks to this day. So if you don't believe this, nobody look in their pockets. There's a quick test here. Now you have repeatedly reviewed pennies for presumably your entire life, or at least as long as you've been in this country. Um, and so I'm going to ask people to put up their hands, which they think is the correct face. So who thinks that A is correct? B, C, D. Okay, well about 50% of you got it correct, which is B. Right, so you have looked at pennies thousands of times, right? And half of you have no idea what it looks like, right? Despite that repeated review. So that begs the question is, how soon do we forget this stuff? Well, this is a guy called Herman Ebenhauser, and I don't usually put pictures of dead white guys in my lectures, but he's actually was a very interesting German psychologist from the um, latter part of the um, 19th century. And he performed a lot of experiments in memory. He performed a lot of them on himself. Um, the IRBs didn't exist at that time. Um, and he had a lot of experiments that, that involved him memorizing a large series of <coughs> random um, syllables like this. So none of these were words, they were just random collections of three groupings of letters, and he would memorize them and then he would see how long it would take to forget them. And from this developed a, a very famous curve called the Ebenhauser curve. And this curve has been substantiated by hundreds and thousands of experiments with all types of different learning ever since. And, it, and it's been multiply substantiated and it's scary. You know, I mean, an hour after you leave this lecture, you'll have forgotten over half of it. Like if I tested you again tomorrow, you'd have lost two thirds of it. I mean, you know, for those of us who spend all this time and effort in developing educational resources and teaching, it's really kind of depressing. And for the learners who spend all your time kind of reading those books, it's kind of depressing. So this is the Ebenhauser curve. And in fact, he came up with a formula for it that the amount of information we retained was inversely proportional to the time since we learned it and proportional to the strength of the memory. So the only way that we can increase how much we retain is either to test ourselves very close to the time we learned it, like cramming for an exam the next day, or increase the strength of the memory, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Here's another experiment he did. So what he did this time was he took various different paradigms, 12, 24, and 36 nonsense syllables, or eight lines of poetry, and he looked on each day, and he did the same thing for six days. How many times did he have to repeat that before he got it right? Now, if we look first of all at the nonsense syllables, not surprisingly, the more he had to learn, the longer it took him to learn it. And then the next day, it was shorter and shorter and shorter. Now, eight lines of poetry has way more than 36 nonsense syllables. But as you can see here, he needed nowhere near as many repetitions to learn it, and he got it completely off the first go um, by about day five. So why is that? Why is the poetry easier to learn than the, the nonsense syllables? It's context, it has context to it. So it's not just these random things, abstract collections, it has context. So does this apply to doctors? Well, here's an experiment I'm very, very glad I didn't take part in. So they took eight, some 80 something or other doctors who were between one year and 55 years out of doing basic sciences at medical school. And they set them an exam, a basic science exam, which contained things everybody would have learned. So you'd have learned it 55 years ago as well as one year ago. So, you know, there wasn't sort of genetic stuff that is newer and so on. And at the end of each question, 
there was a second question and it said, have you ever come across or used this information since the first time you learned it? Yes or no? And this is the information that they said, you know, I learned it, but I, I don't remember ever using this again. So, you know, like Krebs cycle, for example. Um, unless you do pair, in which case you do actually use it. Um, and you can see, you know, it's noisy information because it's sort of, you know, it's much less clean than it's real life type of stuff. But you can see it forms this kind of Ebenhazer curve. Interesting, huh? So how can we interrupt the forgetting? Because that's what we want to do, right? We know that people forget. How can we interrupt that forgetting? Well, Aristotle knew it. I told you this isn't anything new. An exercise repeatedly recalling a thing strengthens the memory. Remember Ebenhazen's formula there. So what this is called, sort of more, um, he said it's called space repetition. Space repetition, you could also just call testing, testing yourself, making yourself remember. So how does this work? So here's our Ebenhazen curve. We just learned a whole bunch of information and now we're sort of gradually forgetting it. Now what happens if tomorrow, we make ourselves try and recall some of this information. We test ourselves on it. Well, what happens is you can return your curve back up so you remember everything, and then the curve is shallower. Do it again, maybe a week later, it's gonna be shallower still, and this will keep going until you retain 100% of the information. So this is called spaced interval testing and we don't do anywhere near enough of it. Now, does this work? So this is the, set, the other half of the doctor's experiment where this was the information they said, yeah, you know, I've used that once or twice. Or I've come across that once or twice. Yeah, yeah, we use it on ICU. And so this is the stuff that's a much flatter curve, even when we're sort of, you can see that they're still scoring like up to a quarter, 55 years out of basic sciences with the stuff that they've had to use and apply. So it's use it or lose it, right? Here's a more controlled experiment. Um, Kerfoot has done a whole load of experiments into spaced interval testing. And this was with urology residents. And it was quite a large study. It had some 800 and something urology residents. And they were divided into two groups and then it was a crossover type of experimental design. And they were learning about urohistopathology. And they had two types of different, I think one was kidney and one was bladder or something like that. Um, for one arm of the experiment, they learned it in the conventional way, web-based modules going through it. In the second way, the second arm, and then they flip-flopped, they did spaced interval testing. So they were, they were, were tested on the information at regular intervals. And what you can see here is, although they were, and that didn't start until sort of a little bit into it, because they had learned the information before they were tested on it. So they learned the information here. These were just reading their web modules. And then they were tested multiple times to see how much that they improved. Now they learned it faster with the regular modules, but they forgot it faster. And when you look further out, it was a spaced interval testing that had the longest and largest amount of retention. Now, does it matter whether we you know, test ourselves once a week or does it need to be increasing intervals? Um, the, the sort of jury's out about that and some studies show one and some show another. This is a study that they were learning Japanese English word pairs and the um, blue bars, they were tested at equal intervals and the red bars, they were tested at increasing intervals. And you can see by the end, you know, the red maybe has a slight edge on it, but not that much. So I don't have the answer to you, but most spaced interval testing does increasing periods of time. So what's happening here with spaced interval testing? Well, when we first learn something, our path to that memory in our mind is very faint. It's difficult. We really have to work out to find it. But each time we travel along that path, that path gets clearer and clearer until we have no problem finding it whatsoever. We can just instantly retrieve it. So we're just wearing a path through the neurons to retrieve that memory. One thing that is clear is we need to allow a little forgetting time. So reading something and testing yourself immediately is nowhere near as efficient as if you allow yourself to forget a bit and you have to work a little bit harder. So it can be a few hours 
or waiting to the next day so you can do that sleep consolidation thing. And that's going to increase the effort that you have to do for recall. And this is called a desirable difficulty. I discovered when I was um, cramming at medical school that I did best if I read for 55 minutes and I slept for 10 minutes. And I would keep doing that. So what are desirable difficulties? Well, you know, it's like a muscle. Your muscle doesn't get, you know, if you only, you know, do bicep curves with five pound weights, that muscle doesn't get a lot stronger. But if you ramp up your rates and kind of push it to work harder, the muscle gets stronger. It's the same with memorizing things. So how can we make something more difficult? Well, testing before you teach it is hard, right? So if I gave you, had given you a quiz at the beginning of this session on memory and learning, you know, you'd be kind of racking your brains trying to, Think what you remember from medical school about it. Allowing yourself to forget some and then remember it. That's a desirable difficulty, makes your brain work harder. And then testing it in a more complex way. So instead of just having to remember it, have to apply it to a problem, have to integrate it with something else, have to create something from that memory. So in order of difficulty, if we're just looking at sort of straightforward testing type of things, Multiple choice questions are pretty easy because, you know, one of the answers is going to be there and you've got one in four or five chance of getting it anyway. If you have to fill in the blank, that's more difficult. If you ask someone to reply with a sentence, that's more difficult. And obviously writing an essay is much more challenging, although, you know, we're not going to do that on most occasions. So let me put some of the things I've talked about together before I talk about some other memory concepts. So priming, frameworks, space repetition and desirable difficulties. How can we use these in teaching? Well, we can use them by providing learning objectives in advance. So we're helping to prime our brain and or putting them up and actually telling people to read them rather than just flashing past them on a slide. If we give pre-learning, like with a flipped classroom, to our learners, we give them a framework to develop. And this is particularly important for junior learners so for first years and second years who may know very little about the subject, just give them something basic to learn before they come into a lecture and they'll be able to encode that information better. You can give them a quick content, content test at the session start. Again, that's going to help with priming. How can we do spaced interval testing? All right, well, we can do teach, you know, we do our conference, we teach it, and maybe we give a little post test at the end, realizing there's not a big gap there. The next day, we could email out some questions in a separate email, email the answers out to the residents and say, just challenge yourself. Just see if you can, you don't need to send me the answers, just look at these and come up with the answer. And then the answers are in a separate email. Do it again a week later. Start your session a month later, your next lecture you're giving with a couple of questions about the prior topic. Okay, space interval testing. They're far more likely to learn it in real time. So how about for learners? Well, if you're studying for your core exam, study something, but test yourself the next day and a week later and a month later on that information. What type of retrieval practice should you use? What type of testing? Well, quizzes can be multiple choice. You know, if you're doing them in real time in a conference, they can be audience response. You can also do summary exercises, read a chapter, and then write down the three most important things that you remember about that chapter. Give a lecture, tell people to do it. Case review situations allow you to apply a lot of information that you've already learned, simulations. Now, flashcards, which, you know, you think kind of a bit of a joke, although I got all the way through medical school using flashcards, is actually a very effective way of learning. Now, this is something called a light in a box. And this is how the original one was based on three boxes and a series of flashcards. And the concept is that you review box one the most frequently, box two the next most frequently, and every now and then you review the contents of box three. If you get any question right, it moves up a box. If you get the question wrong, it goes back to box one until you've learned it. Okay, so you're using spaced interval testing, but also this light in the box method. And there are now a large number of softwares that allow you to do this. So you don't have to kind of sit there with your flashcards. You put in the questions and the answers in, and you tell it to generate them for you. Get it wrong, it keeps coming back until you get it right. Interestingly enough, the ABR with its MOC is working on a similar concept. So if I keep getting a topic wrong, I'm going to get another question about that perking up in my inbox. 
So let's talk about another couple of learning concepts. These sound like weird words, but they actually make a lot of sense when you start to think about them. Generation, elaboration, and mixed practice. So there's a very powerful thing called the generation effect. And that's that you will remember stuff better if you make your brain remember it rather than you simply read it. So I drive the residents or simply hear it. So I drive the residents nuts, you know, when I'm on rotation because they ask me a question and I tell them that they've got to go and look it up and then I will ask them about it several hours later when they think that I've forgotten about it. Or I'll ask them to teach it. If a junior resident asks a question, I will ask the senior resident to teach it to them. They have to generate that information. Here's a study. What they had was a, a large number, I forget how many it was, like 100 or something, um, word pairs. And they were, they were paired in different ways. So they might be apple and pear, or black and white, or doctor and nurse. They were linked in different ways, but they were all clearly pairs. Two groups of subjects. One group of subjects just read through these 100 pairs and learned it that way. The second group of subjects, the first word was written out fully, but the second word had letters missing. So if it was doctor and nurse, it would have doctor, and then it would have N dot dot S dot. So they had to generate that word themselves. And then about a month later, they tested to see when they gave the first word and they gave three options of what the second word was, how many of them got it right, and the ones that had to generate it got a lot more right. Okay, so they had to generate information. So how does this apply? Well, we can improve our learning by having people generate the information. So like I told you about, you know, pre-testing you before I've even taught it, you're having to generate the information from your prior knowledge. Fill in the blank questions or making a summary is generation. They've even shown that if you read a book and then you put it down and you repeat aloud, it has to be aloud, not in your head, what you've said that you'll remember it better. I wouldn't do it on the subway, you'll probably get arrested. Um, I do a lot of drawing, you know, with, if, if I want the residents to show me the difference between a bicornua and a didelphus uterus, you know, I whip up my iPad and I have them draw it for me. Drawing is a really powerful way of generating. It doesn't matter how, you know, I tell them, it doesn't matter how crap your art is, this is not an art show. This is to see that you've got the concepts of it there. Now, reflection and rehearsal exercises are also a powerful way of learning. So say you get a case wrong on call and your attending says, you know, you missed it, or in my case, you know, I've missed it. Walk your brain through, why did I miss that? Did I miss it because I had an inadequate search pattern? Did I miss it because it's really, really subtle? Did I miss it because I just didn't look at it? Did I miss it because I was distracted? Did, it, did I miss it because I've never seen that pathology before? Those things are going to help you remember it. I had a case on call, um, we do evening shift on nine o'clock. I'm normally in bed by nine, I'm a very boring person. And I got home and the, the, I had my resident been doing ultrasound, so I'd been alone for like two hours and it was crazy and we we're reading from 10 institutions. And the moment I got home, I got an email from the ED um, radiologist who had just come on and said, you know, um, they just called me from the ED, you missed a thumb fracture you might want to look back and I looked back at this film and it was so obvious I mean I could not have looked at the thumb so I had to go through it I was like well that is because the history said finger pain it didn't actually say trauma it just said finger pain and I looked at all the fingers but I didn't look at the thumb and you know I was tired I was distracted I was you know so it, it's very important to do this rehearsal is Having your brain generate the information of how you're going to do something. So pilots do this all the time. They run through the simulations, both mentally and then physically, of how they would deal with a particular problem. So before you go in to do a procedure that you've not done for a while, you want to walk your brain through every step and think about, okay, well, if this happens, I'm going to do this. If this happens at this point, I'm going to do that. Along the same thing with generation, I was talking about this this morning, was self-explanation. So self-explanations are asking your learner to say, how did you get to that answer? Not just what the answer is, because sometimes you get the answer wrong, right for the wrong reason. Sometimes it's been a guess. But also, producing self-explanations, even if you got the answer wrong, have been shown to improve memorization. 
So, you know, my poor students and residents that, you know, I'm always going to say, well, why is that? Tell me you're thinking about it. Or I'm going to ask a resident to teach a student or a resident to teach a more junior resident. I ask students to who have different answers to convince the other learner their answer is correct and they self-correct during it. I don't say which answer is correct. On a similar term is elaboration. So elaboration is us trying to make sense of stuff. So we're trying to remember something and we're trying to fit it into a pattern of something we already know, into a context. So in terms of memorability, numbers are really difficult to remember because they're, they're abstract. Abstract words, which includes learning a new language, because that language starts off as being abstract, is more difficult than meaningful words. Abstract images are more difficult to remember than meaningful images. The easiest thing is, is meaningful images. So this is a study that looked at this. So they took a large number of faces, and they had two cohorts. In one cohort, they were given the name of the person. The second cohort, they were given the job of the person. And then they presented the faces again a certain period after and they asked them what their name was or what their job was. And the ones that had the job attached to it got way more of them right. And that's because when they read that this guy was a baker, their mind brought up some kind of a visual pattern for him that they could see him in his bakery they could kind of smell the bread they wondered if he you know what type of baker he was did he do patisserie did he do bread and so on and so it made a, it, they elaborated additional information surrounding this one face so whoops how can we elaborate every time you learn something connect it to something you already know ah yeah that makes total sense because I already know this related fact to it. You're building your memory schemas by doing it. Related to some prior experience. Find common themes and chunk that information together. So as what our brain does is, we have a new memory, it gets stored, it gets recalled, you get new connections added to it, and it goes in this continuous cycle. So just as a sort of basic explanation, say that you've been on CT as a first year, and you've learned that this is an angiomyolipoma because it contains fat, okay? And then you're on ultrasound and Dr. Scout says, well, that's an angiomyolipoma of the kidney. And you could say, okay, that's what an angiomyolipoma looks like and sort of memorize it in isolation. You say, huh, I know that because when I was on CT, it looked like fat. And here, guess what? It looks like fat on the ultrasound as well. And then when you go to MR, wow, this thing looks like fat. It must be the same as an angiomyolipoma that looked on CT or an ultrasound. So this is a question that I put to a first year um, student group. Okay? I have, we have a little mini elective for them and we do a pop quiz at the end um, using audience response. And I put this up and I found that two thirds of people got it wrong, which is kind of interesting for a 50-50 question. And the third who got it right, got it wrong, got it right for the wrong reason when I looked at it. So I thought, well, how can I you know, make it memorable rather than just saying to them, well, you look for the air fluid levels. So I got one of the students to the front, grabbed a water bottle and got her to stand there and say, okay, that water bottle is your stomach or it's a piece of dilated bowel. Now everybody look at it. And then I, made a lie on the middle of the floor and I got everyone over and she had the water bottle lying there and I said okay now look at it what is the difference and like boom they've got it and they'll never forget it so we elaborated onto old information something they're very familiar with so we try and make the abstract real so how can we make the abstract real well by doing visual or verbal constructs of abstract information so making mnemonics mnemonics are a way of you making of you elaborating it into information you already know. You can turn names or numbers into images or into a sentence to remember it because those are easier to remember. And then I'm going to talk a little bit in a bit about memory palaces or the method of loci. So here's a nice strong password, like one that your IT department would totally approve of. It's, not, it's similar to mine, but it's not mine, so don't write it down. Uh, but pretty no, difficult to remember, right? Well, if you turn it into a sentence, then it's not. My hobby is dressmaking. And so this is a very easy one. And every time, my password is sort of similar to this. Every time I, pass, I type my password, 
I'm not saying the letters and the numbers, I'm saying the words. So how could we use generation and elaboration to test ourselves? All right, well, we can say, you know, do I understand it? Not, here's the facts. Do I understand what it really means? What are the concepts that I already know that I can apply to this situation? Can I write a summary? As I said, you know, read a chapter and write a quick summary about the important points. Can I explain it to someone else? If you're somebody who studies as a group, have, have somebody explain to someone else the concept. How does it relate to something I already know? Draw it. You know, I, I'm, as I said, I'm a strong believer in drawing for these things. The final memory concept we're going to talk about is something called mixed practice. So mass practice or block practice is when you practice or test yourself doing the same thing over and over again. Just like, you know, you think I'm going to play these scales over and over again on the piano and eventually I'm going to get that. Or you want to know about left lower lobe pneumonias, I'm going to look at 50 left lower lobe pneumonias on chest x-rays and then I'll be all over pneumonias. And now I'm going to look at the left upper lobe pneumonias and I'll be all over those. Interweave practice is where you mix up what you're learning. So in, instead of um, you know, piano practice, doing your scales, your scales, your scales, you do different scales or you mix up doing your scales with doing some basic other um, piano exercises that you look at a whole load of different pneumonias on chest x-ray, a large number mixed up together. This was a study where they took 16 different types of butterflies. They had four photographs, different photographs of each butterfly. And they took a load of people who knew nothing about butterflies because otherwise that wouldn't have worked out very well. And they did two arms. They had block practice arm that was shown the four pictures of one type of butterfly, then the four pictures of another type of butterfly and so on. And then they had the interweave group where they were shown four different pictures of four different butterflies. Both groups saw the same butterflies the same number of times. They then took an, another fifth picture of each butterfly and they tested on them um, to see what butterfly it was. And this is what came out. So the, the group that had seen only the four butterflies together did much, much worse than the group when they were interweaved. Well, why is that? Well, the interweave group, what they're doing, they're looking at the butterfly and they're saying, okay, well, you know, Viceroy and Baltimore, they both got um, red, white, and black. However, the Baltimore has got a lot more white on it. You can't do that when you have block, that compare and contrast. You can't do it when you have block practice. In this experiment, they had two, um, these were uh, middle school grade kids, and they were either learning um, algebra or slopes of a graph. They had one group that learned algebra, 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 then slopes of graph, slopes of graph, slopes of graph, and there's one where the problems were mixed up. And you can see here that even one day out from learning it, the interweave group did much better, and certainly much, much better 30 days out. And that's because the interweave group not only had to look at the problem and identify what type of problem it was, as well as solve it, where the other group knew that it was just another slope, it was another slope, another slope, and so on. Here's, a, here's one for first year medical students. They did EKG learning patterns. Two groups, block practice, learning all about left bundle branch block, all about right bundle branch block, all about sinus tachycardia, et cetera, et cetera. And the second group were interweaved. So all the different abnormalities were mixed in together and they had to try and work out what they were. And again, in the final test, the interweave group did much better. Related to this interweave practice is variable practice. In this case, instead of learning different things mixed together, you may use a different method to learn the same thing. So mix up your different methods. So if you were learning about pneumonia, instead of just looking at images of pneumonia, you might write some multiple choice questions about it. You might write what you know about it on a study, as well as doing the cases. French verbs here, I did a couple of different options as well. In this study, they took third graders and they were doing bean toss. And they had two groups of individuals and they had um, one cohort of the kids, they did it for six weeks, who stood and tossed beans from three foot away. The other group tossed them from two foot away or four foot away, but never tossed them from three foot away. At the end of six weeks, they tested them and the kids, uh, and they tested them both at three foot. The kids who had never tossed at three foot did better. 
Interesting, hey? So they've done this with a lot of different, um, you know, American football um, trainers and such like, uh, basketball players, a, a large number of different sports have started to do this. So instead of them doing the same thing again and again, they mix up their practices. They do variable practice so that they're doing high jumps, low jumps, not just high jumps, high jumps, high jumps, and so on. So these two things together, interweave practice and variable practice, can be grouped together into say mixed practice. In other words, you know, when you're trying to test yourself, do it in lots of different ways, not just the same way. Now, how might I do something like this in radiology in a lecture? Well, say I'm talking about breast calcifications and I'm talking about DCIS. So the block practice would be, I'll just sit and I would go through a whole load of different examples of DCIS. And then I would sit and I would go through a whole load of different examples of milk of calcium. But a much better way is to interweave them. So interweaving benign and malignant calcifications and having the residents having to work out the difference. Even better is doing a compare and contrast. Three sets of linear calcifications. Which ones are benign? Which ones are malignant? Why? Why are you saying that this one here in the middle is the one that's malignant and you're saying these two are benign? What are the defining characteristics like that? Think about this as cross-training. So we talked about warming, warming up exercises, your brain. This is cross-training. So we could cross-train by having us apply our skills and our knowledge in different ways. So multiple choice questions test recognition. Case conferences make us generate the information. ESAT conferences, which is when, um, I was telling the folks about this morning, one person faces the front and they have to describe it to everybody else who's facing the back and the people at the back have got to get it from that description, it's both elaboration and generation. Compare and contrast has that either we interweaving factor moved in. So what are we doing now? Well, we've got that pathway in our brain, and we're not only traveling down that one same pathway again and again, but we're actually coming at the pathway from different angles. So that means that we can start to apply information in different ways. It's a much more powerful way of learning. And this is what gets us in what's called near transfer of learning, which means that when we learn something, we can only apply it in a very similar situation. So if we've, you know, we've learned how lift up a lobe collapse looks like, we can only recognize lift up a lobe collapse that looks exactly the same or very similar to the one that we saw when we were learning it. As opposed to what we really want people to do, which is far transfer of learning, which means that they can recognize left upper lobe collapse of different severities and different body shapes on different modalities and so on. So, does this work? Well, um, I made this lecture about two and a half years ago. Well, I did the research this lecture about two and a half years ago, got around to, before I got around to doing it, and I became interested in it. And I thought, what would be a real challenge to test it out on? I thought, you know, and I'm, I'm very bad at remembering numbers. I have to look at like a phone number three times before I get it right. I thought, I'll learn pi to 500 paces in both directions. If I can do that, this stuff may work. I mean, you, you know, you realize I'm crackers anyway, but you know, I just like, you know what, I'll do it. This will be kind of fun, so I'll see if this stuff works. So um, to do this, I developed a memory palace, I'll tell you about in a minute. And then I used all of these effects in combination, I told you that this stuff doesn't just work in isolation, um, to try and learn um, pi to 500 paces. So um, you guys probably know that, um, have heard of memory palaces, if, um, I'm just blanking on the name of the show, someone tell me. Sherlock Holmes, thank you. There you go, that's good memory for you. Um, that he uses memory palaces as part of this. So this was developed by the ancient Greeks as a way of transferring their oral histories. They didn't have written histories, they had these very elaborate oral histories that they handed on from generation to generation, which they had to memorize. And memorization was considered a, a very valuable skill. It was very much um, you know, honored and <coughs> respected in their culture. So in a sort of very simplistic way of thinking about it, our memory for places is much, much stronger than our memory for pretty much anything else. I mean, if you close your eyes, and you, you mentally walk into your house or your apartment and walk around it, you know, you'll be able to sort of pretty much identify everything that's in every, every place of your house without any effort whatsoever. So what they did is they connected 
objects or phrases or numbers, depending on what it was, with different locations in their house. So you have a, so this person is memorizing, um, I don't know, some random items of things. It could be a shopping list that you're remembering. Um, and you place your shopping list, each item of your shopping list in different places, like we did when we um, started the session. So the only time I had available to do this, it was in winter, was when I run for 30 minutes on the treadmill in the mornings. So the first thing I had to do is I use something that's called the major number scheme. And this is what's used by, um, you know, these uh, people who go to these memory competitions and then pie to 30,000 places and things. And you convert, and I converted all the numbers from one to 99 to a picture. And, and this is a, a standard way where N is a two, M is a three, N is a, um, V is a eight and so on. Um, and then had each of those was made into a word and I had a visual. So 23 is a gnome and 28 is a, a guy in Navy uniform. I like uniforms. And these had to be visuals that were powerful to me. Um, I'm not going to tell you what 17 is. Um, the, 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 some of them that are not for public consumption, but you know, what was important is whether I could remember it. And then these got combined to make four digits. So starting off 3.145 is a motor with a tail on it. And that is sitting on my mailbox. And then each sequential number has me walking down my driveway into my garage, around each room in my house, around my yard, back into my house and so on, until I've made 500 um, different numbers there. There's a fish in a bra that's sitting on my daughter's windowsill. My house is now a little bit weird to me, I have to say, because I do see these visuals in strange places. My kids think I'm completely berserk. Um, so how long did it take? Because this was kind of, this was actually kind of fun to do, but I found that the hardest thing was learning that first hundred. And that took about 30 minutes a day for five days before I learned that. I then, one night before I went to sleep, I placed those blocks. So I, I had 25 different places in my house, the first 25. And I, had, I visually imagined a guy in Navy fishing or something like that, or whatever it happens to be, or a knight stepping on ice cubes or, you know, these strange things. And I'd spent about an hour doing that. I got up the next morning. And I went on the treadmill and said, okay, I've done my sleep consolidation. Let's see if it worked. And I remembered 95. I was like, holy cow. I can't believe I did that. I've just done you know, 95 words of pie. So then learning the rest didn't take very long. It took a couple of weeks of the treadmill. And once I'd learned it one way, well, I just had to walk around the house backwards. And then I knew it the other way. So, you know, a complete waste of time and, you know, completely useless thing to learn, but it was interesting. All right, so in summary, using these evidence-based learning theories can improve your learning efficiency or your teaching efficiency. But key to these is you have to test yourself. Like there's gotta be a self-testing component. You must retrieve that information and you have to keep repeatedly retrieving it. And by adding one of these desirable difficulties, things like time, having to challenge yourself to learn it in a more difficult, uh, repeat it in a more difficult way is helpful. And these specific techniques such as generation, elaboration, primary and mixed practice can all improve your learning. So let's see if we remember the shopping list. So you walked in the back door and you saw, you walked down those stairs on this wall, walked out here in the Coca-Cola and spilt the horseradish on your hot dogs, band-aids, grass, pickles. Okay, the average person can remember six items of a 12 item list, not necessarily in the right order. All right, so you just built a little memory palace and you'll probably remember those. Like if I asked you in a month, you probably still remember that. Again, I've just wasted some of your neurons. <laughs> How about this? Yeah. I know it's a sad because the seams split. So here are two great books that I highly recommend. This, um, this book by Peter Brown, I give a lot of my learners and educators. It's, uh, it's written for the lay public, so it's not, you know, a lot of educational publications are really 
really difficult to read the papers. Um, and this is very readable. And I think it's a really good way of, of learning how to learn better. Um, this is more entertaining. So this guy was a journalist and he covered the American Memory Championships. And when he was there, you know, he got kind of like the last straw task of the journalists that day. Um, and he said to these, these people, you know, you, you, you're amazing. I mean, you've just got these amazing memories. And they would say, no, actually we have average memories, but we've learned these techniques. And they talked to him about it. And he decided that he wanted to um, win the American Memory Championships within a year. Right? He'd never done that stuff in his life, and he did. Um, now, apparently, the American Memory Championships are way easier than the European ones, I'd just like to point out, but all the same, it's quite an achievement. But the book is not only about his journey doing that, but it brings up a lot of this history and the Greek history and everything of, of memorization, which I think is really interesting. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, do you ever get accused, though, because I think one of the things you haven't really spoken about is the pressure of time. And when you're a resident or a medical student, it would be great to use space interval learning. It's more effective, but it takes so much time. I think that's why it people cram. But it doesn't really, because you can do it. I mean, if you, it's like you make flashcards for the first time. I mean, it takes time to make them, but then flipping through them and learning that information is very fast and much more effective. And you're gonna to have to mm -hmm. do it many less times, you are gonna to have to read the same information. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like pi to 500 paces. It, it took me, you know, my, a few minutes on my treadmill every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, there's a lot of tools out there that can allow you to do this very efficiently. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you think that two hours spent reading chapters is used efficiently, it's not. Mm -hmm. Because by the end of it, you know, there's a very good chance that you've forgotten at least 50% an hour later. But could you have just crammed your pie to 500 places in like a couple of hours? No. Okay. Could have, no way. <laughs> okay. No way. I'm a crammer. Okay. Any other questions? But that's then you flush the toilet on it. You see? Exactly. <laughs> no, you don't but want you the residents flushing the toilet on it because they, you want them to be radiologists, know this stuff forever, not for. You know, I'm not going to kind of show you, but I remember a remarkable amount of that pie, and it was two and a half years ago that I did it, and I've not been practicing. It's, it's stuck. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I'll get rid of it, actually. Yeah. So they did this one experiment, and they, God knows how they got this IRB for it, and they gave people propofol. They taught them something. It must have been in Europe, because you'd never get to it in America. They gave them propofol, you know, learned something, gave them propofol, woke them up and tested them, and they found that they remembered much better. So, yes, give your residents a nap after lunchtime conference. I totally reinforce that. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, yes, yes. sir. How about So you, if you don't sleep long enough, then you don't consolidate the information and rehearse it. So it takes time, it takes a certain, so that's probably one of the problems if people, you know, are staying up late and cramming and then they're sleeping for three hours, those memories have not had time to be able to get consolidated and rehearsed and reorganized in your brain because that takes hours. Any um, research or relating Don't know. Don't know. I don't know the answer to that, Leslie. I think, you know, I've still, I have, there's a lot of things that I found I used to forget a lot of, and I apply a lot of it now to it. Like people's names are turned into something visual because I'm very bad at names. Um, and, you know, if you associate it with a characteristic of their face, then it's even better. But usually you can't tell them what it is. Um, <laughs> and you know, and I. That's what they say. <laughs> I'm never going to get right. Yeah, I wish I could get. Uh, see, but you'll be so much better after it. Yeah. 
All right, Petra, this is something for us, for your mind palace. Oh, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Great